All right. So thanks a lot for joining my talk and welcome to compile time and runtime dependency injection. So um, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for the great organization for this quite cool conference and for what's going on so far. Um, and in the next, yeah, uh, in the next time I'll, I'll talk about um, how we are using compile time and runtime dependency injection. Um, I go with you through an example and I think we have quite enough time. So feel free to ask any questions uh, directly. We'll also have some, some time afterwards um, if, you, if you want to um, ask your questions later. Um, right, so short overview um, of well, some words about myself, um, what I was doing in, um, till I got here. So I was studying automotive engineering in Stuttgart. I'm living in Germany near Stuttgart um, and had some working experience at, at different companies. And afterwards, I did a PhD on simulation-based validation of advanced driver system systems. And that was also the time where I really got in touch and also more or less fell in love with uh, C++ software development and especially in the area of advanced driver system system or autonomous driving. Yeah, I think C++ there is on the, on the embedded systems, the core language to be used. Uh, after my PhD, I continued as a software developer for C++ simulation models at ETAS, that's also a company here in Stuttgart. Um, we are doing, or we were doing um, hardware in the loop tests. And on the one hand, you have the real ECU, uh, uh, the software or the machine that later will be used in the vehicle. And on the other hand, you need simulation models. And there I was still focusing on simulation models of advanced driver assistance systems. Um, you can imagine that's quite similar to developing a a PC game. So in the end, you're driving around in a virtual environment with your virtual vehicle and simulating sensors, video, radar, LiDAR, ultrasonic. And that was, uh, that was what we were doing there. And then I joined uh, Stiel. They are mainly known for their chainsaws. You probably uh, know them from, from that area. But they also are developing the thing you see in the background here, uh, autonomous mowers. And that's where I'm currently working on as a software developer slash architect, um, also C++ based. And that's also um, where we are using the techniques or testing approaches and dependency injection we are talking about today. Um, in parallel, I am also giving lectures on software development at Stuttgart. Um, yeah, that's what I do in my, one of the things I like to do in my free spare time. So a short agenda, four points we'll discuss today. So I'll introduce a very simple alarm clock example, which we use throughout the talk. And here we will have a very simple, naive implementation we will start with, which is not testable. And we will then evaluate that one um, to use runtime dependency injection on the first uh, approach. And then, we'll have a look how can we achieve the same thing based uh, at compile time using templates. And in both examples, in the end, we're splitting the alarm clock example. And in the end, we'll shortly sum up um, what we've just seen. Okay. The, the basic idea of the alarm clock example we'll just um, go through. So we want to have an alarm clock class, which enables us to set the current time set an alarm and deactivate the alarm. All right, um, the alarm shall be outputted to the console. So that's the, the, the basic idea we'll now um, go through as the example of this talk. Um, and I think it's, it's a pretty simple um, approach or implementation. Right, so everything I, I show you can find uh, at Compile Explorer. I have the link here. Um, so just head over to that page. Um, you'll find the, the complete source code here. And yeah, the, the example using the runtime dependency injection, 
but you'll see in a minute, it's quite simple to um, use that one as um, for the compile time dependency injection also. Okay, so the alarm clock example, let's give a short overview of the API we would like it to have. So we use Chrono to, to have time functionality. We call our class alarm clock, fine so far. We have that one using declaration just to or simplify the things here a bit. Um, we have three public methods, the set alarm, activate and deactivate functions. Set alarm, we can pass a time point where we want our alarm clock to ring. We can activate or deactivate it, and that's mainly it. We have some private method uh, which continuously checks the alarm. Uh, we won't go into the details of how you will realize that it's checked continuously in the on Compile Explorer on the code. You can see it there. It's just called uh, permanently, but you can. Uh, it might be a separate thread that gets launched by the alarm clock and so on. But that's not interesting for our example here. But um, the core thing here to, to remember the check alarm method gets called continuously, something like maybe every second, um, which then checks if the alarm needs to ring or not. Right. So that's the basic API. I think um, you're quite used to uh, that that approach. And let's let's have a look at our naive implementation. So first the, the first seven lines here we we implement the check alarm method. If we are not active, we're just returning. We're not doing anything, right? Uh, if we're active, then on line four, we need to check if now is approximate alarm time, okay? Uh, do we need to ring? If so, then we ring the alarm, and that's that's all the check the alarm method is doing. Now let's have a look at the two other methods we're calling here. Now is approximate alarm time, so we just very simplified uh, call the, the now function from Chrono, uh, checks the difference between the alarm time and if the difference is small enough, like one second or something similar, then we return true, otherwise we return false. Um, and our ring the alarm outputs alarm on the command line. Okay, so basically that naive implementation satisfies um, mainly the requirements we had at the beginning. And on the right, I've here drawn a very simple uh, dependency diagram. The alarm clock, we now depend on Chrono and on IO stream to have time functionality and to output something on the console. Fine. Now let's head over to the testing section of that approach. Um, let's write a short test. In, in style of Google Test Framework, but that doesn't matter. So um, we we have we want to check if the alarm rings after ten minutes. So what are we doing on line two? We create an alarm clock object, and we, we for our test we set a ring time where we want to want it to ring. We say now in ten minutes. Okay, we set the alarm on our clock, and how do we now proceed? Now we have to wait quite a while. Right, so we have to wait ten minutes for our test to be to execute, and then hopefully it outputs something on the console. Um, but how do we actually check the output? So we we would need to pass the console something. So uh, as we can see here, it the, the testing approach has two, or the the implementation regarding testing has two main drawbacks. Um, so the test is very slow. If we need to wait 10 minutes for a test to um, to run, that's not acceptable. Um, if you imagine a test suite of multiple thousand tests, that's that's not what we can go for. And how do we check the output? It's if we need to somehow grab console and, and read lines there, that's also not, not ideal. So I think basically if you... One of my favorite lectures is the out of unit testing by Roy Osharov. And if you if you have a look there, yeah, in the end, he defines a unit test as um, having uh, control over all dependencies. And that's not what we're having here. So we're not having control of over time and we're not having control over, the, over our console. So our current naive implementation of the alarm clock is just not testable. 
Um, right. That was the first introduction of the alarm clock example. I think we all now understand um, what we want to achieve. And now let's make this one testable. Uh, split the alarm clock example and first approach by using runtime dependency injection. So we need to split up our class hierarchy that the alarm clock no longer directly depends on chrono or IO stream, but we introduce interfaces instead. So the alarm clock now will have a reference to an abstract base class, uh, which is our C++ way of implementing interfaces in general. Um, I've called it time interface and one, the other one is output interface. So the time interface will later on be implemented by a class called time impl and in the end, this might output on chrono. So this alarm clock um, implementation still in the end has a reference on chrono and the same is true for the output interface. Uh, here we have the output interface, which will be implemented by output console class. And this one has standard dependency to IO stream. So the functionality will stay exactly the same, but um, we we will um, we now do have those additional two layers, the interfaces and the additional implementations of the classes. So what's um, let's let's have a short look at those those interfaces, and then um, I think we'll see the main benefit if we have a look at the testing approach. So how might such a time interface look like? We still include Chrono in the interface, but that's not an issue. We only need this for the using declaration, as we want to use time point here as our um, our construct, and and that's fine because we are. Uh, only depending on the on this type and not on its functionality. Uh, we have a, a default virtual destructor, sorry, a virtual one that's missing here. And um, we have the virtual method, the pure virtual method time point now. So that's, you can imagine, okay, the now method will later return a time point and this needs to be implemented by the time implementation class. Okay, quite clear so far, I think. That's the main method of interest, the now uh, method from our time interface class because we need that one. And the same is true for the output interface. There, we also have a pure virtual method or in that case, a pure virtual operator which um, takes a string and um, we can use that uh, operator we know from uh, C out. Right, those are the two interfaces, quite uh, quite simple and straightforward. And now we need to adapt our constructor of the alarm clock. So the alarm clock uh, itself needs to include the interfaces. And we here do dependency injection uh, at constructor, uh, at construction or uh, when, when we create the object. So, um, we use a const reference of the time interface and a reference, a non-const reference to the output interface. And we'll store those private variables um, within, the, within our class implementation. So by that, we can inject our dependencies, but we're not injecting the real implementations, uh, but the interfaces only. So the alarm clock does not know anything directly about how time interface might be implemented or the output interface. Um, it knows, okay, I can use the whatever functionality those interfaces allow me to use, but I cannot, um, I have no direct dependency on um, the, the, the real implementation, which would be uh, Chrono or um, uh, IO stream. Second, right. So, um, now, how do we construct such an object? Um, we we no longer can just instantiate it uh, as in line four, but we need two additional objects, um, the time implementation T and our output console O. Um, the time impl implements the time interface as we've seen in the class diagram and the output console implements the output interface. And we pass that to the constructor of our alarm clock class. So, 
this way, we still have exactly the same functionality. Uh, time input T returns now, which is now of STD chrono. And output console O, we can write our string, uh, which then just forwards it and writes it to C out. So here we can now see the slightly adapted implementation of our naive alarm clock approach. It looks pretty exactly the same, except for two, those two lines, line 10 and line 15. We now don't call now directly from chrono, but we use time dot now. So we use the, the time interface, which provides a now class to use time. And we write our output string alarm no longer to see out directly, but to our output interface. So those are the only two differences we need to make uh, to, regarding our implementation here. And the functionality is still the same. So which, what's the main advantages of introducing those two lines? The main advantage is that we now can have multiple implementations of our interface. So the time interface itself cannot only be implemented by our time impl, which uses chrono, but by our time fake also. Um, so we can create a fake which implements the time interface class and that fake is only relevant for testing. The same is true for the output interface. It can, on the, in, in the real use case, be implemented by the output console, which uses IO stream, or by the output fake, um, which we use for testing. And having this functionality um, is one, one of the main um, advantages of adding those interfaces. There are several others. For example, you can now imagine, ah, it, the alarm clock itself doesn't care where to output. It just outputs on the output interface. Now you can easily implement uh, not only an output to console, but you can output create an output to file. You can create an output to a web server and whatever. The uh, implementation of alarm clock does not have to change. So that's a great advantage of introducing those interfaces here that um, the, the core implementation of alarm clock does not need to know where time comes from or where to output. It just uses the time interface and the output interface. Let's have a look at the testing. Um, so it, it looks quite similar as before. We now need to construct our alarm clock object a bit differently. We need T and the O dependencies. In that case, the object T is a time fake, which also implements the time interface, and O is an output fake, which implements the output interface. We still have the same um, test approach. We want to check if alarm rings after 10 minutes, but now we can just increase our time. We don't have to wait for 10 minutes. We can say our new T time T is T now plus 10 minutes, so we that's a functionality, of course, only the time fake object um, provides, but that's exactly what we need for testing. And we can check the output. So we don't need to read any console stuff directly, but we can uh, use the output fake functionality to query what was written into the output fake. And by that approach, um, we made our alarm clock implementation just um, testable. Yeah, and that's the that's our main motivation currently um, to to make our modules or classes testable, um, and we we're using that approach quite extensively in our daily work. So that was the splitting of the alarm clock example using runtime dependency injection. Now let's over, head over to compile time time dependency injection. Why, 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 why is that a, a thing at all? So by introducing the interfaces or the pure abstract base classes, we introduce something that might be relevant if you're in the embedded development. So I say it might be relevant because, yeah, I'm doing embedded development on, on a daily basis. And in very rare cases only, we we cannot afford having the overhead of a virtual function call introduced by the abstract base classes. Um, so in general, our approach is to use runtime dependency injection where possible. 
um, as it's a very flexible approach, very uh, user-friendly, and not only regarding testing, but also extending the functionalities. Uh, as mentioned, you cannot only have the, the console output interface, but you can have many different output interfaces. But there might be edge cases where you do not want to afford that additional uh, uh, in direction uh, using that virtual function call. And that uh, that's where compile time dependency injection might be an option you can use. Um, and the approach I'll show you, but it's quite similar to splitting the alarm clock example regarding runtime dependency injection. Let's just do the same thing at compile time. So this class hierarchy looks quite similar to what you've seen already. But instead of having the interfaces, we I've just visualized it that way, we have something else in between here. So actually, we don't really have something in between. It's just to visualize and to, to sketch it similar to the previous class hierarchy. Um, so the idea is we still want our alarm clock class to either use a time implementation or a time fake to have the flexibility to inject something. but we do not want to have the, the cost of the uh, abstract base class and the virtual function calls. So um, what are we doing here? Um, the, the core approach is to use templates um, and to have the dependencies, template parameters of our, of our class. So we, we introduce templates parameter type and output, and we do the same approach as previously. So we input, um, we inject the dependencies at construction, um, store references to it, and that's it. And um, by that, we do no longer have any uh, interfaces, um, but we will later on um, operate on the real classes directly. So. Yeah, as, as you see here, the main differences are in line one, four, nine, ten. So we, we introduce the template parameters time and output here in, in capital. And currently at this point in time, the alarm clock implementation does not know anything about those parameters. Um, it will, the implementation of the alarm clock and the methods will use exactly the same uh, implementation. It will call uh, time now and uh, right to the output. This means those two classes need to have the um, need to implement those methods, of course. So, how do we construct that object? Uh, we can do it in a quite similar fashion. So, our alarm clock now has um, still the dependency to time implement output console, but uh, now as they are passed as template parameters. Um, we can use the same approach if you're using C17 or above uh, with class template argument deduction. And then the code looks pretty much the same or quite exactly the same as if we're using interfaces. Now you see line two or three, time no longer implements the abstract base class time interface, but it's a standalone implementation of uh, whatever we want it to be. Um, so one, one downside of that approach is that you do not have the, the, the nice definition or the blueprint of having such an interface, but the great advantage is you uh, no longer have the cost of the overhead um, of having a virtual function call. So um, we inject it uh, as a compile time. Uh, template parameters. We injected uh, the dependencies also here in the um, constructor. And why are we doing that? The, the main thing is if we have a look at the testing side, the approach is quite similar. So as before, we, we create our alarm clock um, overheading the dependencies T and O and the time fake T and the output fake O um, they both, we, we need to access both elements later on. So we need to access time fake T to adjust uh, on the one hand to calculate ring time, but also to adjust the T time now to increase time. And we need to 
access the output fake O to evaluate the result. So having um, time fake and output fake as direct member variables only, that's not an option because otherwise we do not get access or we would need getters and so on, but I don't really like that approach. Um, this way of accessing or um, injecting the dependencies at construction, um, that's, uh, I think, way more preferable. Right, so um, this way we we no longer have abstract base classes. We still have the same implementations. And if it's very time critical, we in, in our project, we have some edge cases where we don't want to have the overhead. Um, then this approach might be preferable. Um, but in general, I would go for the solution of having the runtime dependency approach, right? So you see here, we just create the time fake and output fake classes and inject them into our alarm clock implementation. Okay, that's basically it. Um, so let's wrap it up shortly, um, what we've seen so far. Um, so the main advantages of our runtime um, dependency injection is that we can change the implementation during runtime easily. So uh, we cannot only change which objects uh, we might to write on, but uh, or which which might we might use during um, during the lifetime of our object. But uh, runtime dependency injection in general allows you to exchange the, the real um, underlying implementations, even at runtime, that you can change if you're outputting to console or if you're outputting to a file. Uh, you might switch that during runtime, which might be relevant in some uh, use cases. One other advantage I see is having clear interface definitions. So. Um, you can write, as we've seen, those abstract base classes, which just define whoever wants to be uh, a time interface needs to implement those functionalities. Um, so I think that's a, a great advantage of having that clear definition. Um, but of course, you will have virtual function calls. The compiler, depending on your, your setup, might some now and then be able to eliminate those, um, but in general, you you need to double check and you cannot ensure or be sure that they will be in, eliminated. If we, on the other hand, have a look at the compile time, the pros and cons. So the concrete implementations must be known at compile time and you cannot uh, easily switch them or you cannot switch them at runtime easily. Um, you have no direct interface definition. I think that's uh, a disadvantage of uh, the compile time approach. And um, you have no virtual function calls. That's, of course, the, the main benefit you can get here, uh, a little performance improvement if that is relevant to you, which it might be in the embedded edge case. Right. So. That's it from my point so far. I think we can uh, shortly, if you like to, we can shortly go through that, uh, the source code here on Compiler Explorer. But if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask them directly. Um, otherwise, I shortly present you the, the, the approach, we, we, the implementation here on Compiler Explorer for a few minutes and then um, yeah, we're done. So um, right here, the, we, we include all the things. So the, the Compiler Explorer example is set up on one file only. Um, we have the interface definitions here. We, we have um, the, the output interface, the, our operator. We have the time interface, uh, which has the now method returning a time point. We have our two implementations. On the one hand, the output console, which implements the output interface. And here you can see it it really does nothing special. It just uses C out, uh, forwards, or use that string it gets by const reference and puts it into C out. And the same is 
true for the time implementation. It implements the time interface. Um, it has the now method, and in the end, it just uses Chrono system clock, the now functionality. That's absolutely fine for those. So the, the, the core concept of those two implementations was to split up our naive approach. And here, those implementations, of course, can use the real functionality of Cout and Chrono. Um, but for the fakes, we don't need those, right? Um, here, our simple alarm clock class with runtime dependencies, we're still using time point uh, alias here, uh, or the using declaration, right? Then we forward the um, time interface and output interface um, here as constructor arguments assigned to the member variables um, and initialize our additional member variables. Here we have the set alarm method, activate, deactivate, and the check alarm method, which is public in that case. Um, we have our two helper functions. Now it's approximate alarm time and the ring alarm. Here I'm using 10 milliseconds only for the difference and our member variables. And here we have the, the usage of everything. We have the time impl t, the output console O, and the alarm clock object alarm, which gets T and O passed as reference. We then set the alarm to be now plus 25 milliseconds. We activate our alarm. And here we have a simple for loop, which continuously checks the alarm and then sleeps for a while. And if we now have an additional look at the execution view, we get an alarm which rings once and we can use um, for our real implementation, but also for our testing approach if we use fakes accordingly. All right. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. I think I'm quite a bit ahead of time, but if you have questions, feel free to ask them now.